How many of you have heard of the Nobel Prize in Physics this year? Okay. Uh, who received them? Keep on. Very good. All right. And uh, so, yeah, these are the three people. Something you may or may not know is that uh, is exactly how Nobel Prize awards uh, work. So, of course, these three gentlemen uh, deserved what they got. And we'll talk about uh, um, some of their work, including the work of um, another thousand odd scientists uh, who went along in the quest for finding gravitational waves. Uh, but there was another gentleman named Ron Driver, okay, from uh, Scotland, who actually missed out on this award. If you were alive at the time Nobel Prizes were announced earlier this year, then uh, Ron Driver would have received it. Okay. There's a limit on the number of Nobel Prizes that are given in a subject per year, and that is three. Um, and it is not given posthumously. Anyway, so this award was given for the decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and the observation of gravitational waves. And um, you have perhaps already seen some of the pictures I'm going to show you here. Hopefully, some of the anecdotes I narrate uh, will be new to you. But uh, these, this is not an artist's image. Okay, this is actually um, produced by um, calculations of general relativity to represent the two black holes that LIGO discovered in 2015 September. In fact, they were observed in a state of orbital motion about their common center of mass before they merged and produced presumably a single more massive black hole, okay? And uh, yeah, what is, so it's, just, it's a simulation, it's not the true image, uh, but it's better than a, an artist simulation. Um, and because gravity bends light, and do you know those um, aspects of gravity? Okay, I'm, I'm, maybe I'll have time to um, get into some depth in that regard. Um, so for that reason, even, Starlight gets bent as it passes through the vicinity of these gravitating objects. Um, so which is why you can see some focusing and uh, these stars beyond um, these two black holes appear uh, you know, more dense uh, for that reason. But this is not the only source of gravitational waves, which by the way are ripples in the curvature of space-time. And uh, again, um, I'm telling you uh, some of the motivational things initially, but I'll perhaps have time to get into more details on this uh, momentarily. Um, there are other sources of gravitational waves, for example, the death of a star, okay? So, um, this is the picture of what? Crab yeah. Nebula. I had to show it, why? Because it's a supernova and <laughs> Because it's a radio school. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so this is um, what lies at the, so this is actually the debris of a supernova explosion, you know, more precisely a type 2 supernova explosion, uh, which uh, left behind a rapidly spinning neutron star uh, somewhere at that point, which actually we can observe uh, in multiple wavelengths. And um, these neutron stars sent out um, uh, uh, radiation, um, including uh, in general, you know, the radio uh, waves, which uh, we can observe with radio telescopes here. Uh, but another aspect of this, or another aspect of this picture to this talk is that neutron stars can also form, or can be found in binary systems, just like the black hole binary I showed you on the previous slide. And these neutron star binaries also emit gravitational waves as they spiral in. And we have, it turns out, seen uh, that kind of a binary as well uh, in August this year, okay? But even if a neutron star is not in a binary system, it can still isolatedly produce gravitational waves um, uh, for the following reason. First of all, of course, this explosion, and how many, um, is there a discussion of how uh, stars die in this school? Okay, um, maybe I have a slide on that as well, but anyway, um, 
um, at the end of a star's life, um, depending on the initial mass of the star, it will leave behind a core that is um, either a neutron star or a black hole. Those are not the only fates, by the way. The, the, the sun will not meet that fate. Okay? But in the process of producing such a you know, compact object, um, this dying star can produce gravitational waves. So supernova explosions can emit gravitational waves, but they happen to be quite weak. Um, however, if we have an explosion like this not too far, from Earth, and of course not too close for comfort. Um, they, then the gravitational waves can be strong enough, uh, bright enough for us to see here. Okay, how many of you have heard of the star called uh, Betelgeuse? Where is it? <laughs> All right, that's excellent. So, what kind of a star is it? <laughs> what can happen to it? <laughs> It can actually go off with an explosion like this anytime, all right? And so we would like to have it and um, you know, if it produces gravitational waves that are strong enough, that will be great. That's one way. The other way is that after the neutron star has been produced, if uh, it has a bit of a, an asphericity, deviation from spherical um, uh, or even axisymmetry, okay, then um, it can produce gravitational waves as long as uh, it is spinning because what the source of gravitational waves is essentially a time varying quadrupole moment. Okay? Monopole moment would be just for example the spherical mass um, um, but for producing gravitational waves you need at least a quadrupole moment. So, um, so those kinds of gravitational waves we have not observed but who knows maybe one of or some of you will observe in the future um, if, if I don't. Uh, so Newtonian gravity, of course, you know, uh, but it's a highly successful theory of gravity because uh, this is, well, of course, it explains why apples fall and why, why the moon falls um, around the Earth, but, but we use Newtonian gravity for the most part to even launch satellites, okay? So it explains the, 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 the trajectories of the satellites, but also rockets um, that leave Earth's uh, gravity eventually. Um, it explains Kepler's laws of planetary motion. It does not predict gravitational waves. But one of the problems with Newtonian gravity, oh, well, why do you think uh, Newton's gravity may not be the right theory of gravity? Yes. Because it applies to micro Because it doesn't tell you the mechanism by which gravity it is an action and action. Yeah. 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 According to relativity, uh, instantaneous action is not possible. Okay. So, yeah, it is inconsistent with special relativity. And I think, how many of you have um, some knowledge of special relativity? Right. Um, so, for example, if the sun suddenly disappeared, okay, right at this moment, um, then Newtonian gravity would say that uh, you, yeah, you will know that instantaneously because Earth's uh, orbit will be affected. Um, but, but special relativity tells you that there is a finite speed with which information can travel. Okay, and uh, so we will be, we will not know about Earth's disappearance until about eight minutes after it disappears. Okay, so and then of course there were deviations from Kepler's laws. How? Yeah, precision of the orbit of Mercury. Precision of Mercury's orbit, orbits, uh, uh, yeah, perihelion. So, um, does somebody have a piece of paper that? I'm not borrowed, I'm not returning it to you. And uh, what about a thick sketch pen? I should come prepared. Nobody has a sketch pen. Ah, okay, this may not work. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is, you know, Einstein came about, right, about a, a little over 100 years ago and said, okay, so of course Newton's, Newton's uh, gravitational theory has problems that you identified. Yes. Oh, okay. Nice. So, so Einstein found a better way to explain gravity, and he said gravity is the curvature of space-time. All right. And the way to envisage that is the following. So, this is space for you. For the moment, uh, let us forget about time. Okay. Um, if time permits, we can return to that at the end of the talk. But and to understand space-time curvature, what you can do is you can set up a grid in this room, right? How will you set up a grid? 
just to shoot laser beams in all three, say, orthogonal directions. Orthogonality is not an essential requirement. But anyway, so you set up, a, in this case, a Cartesian grid, right? Um, and you find all of these rays intersecting with, uh, you know, wherever they intersect, they do it 90 degrees. Um, but now, if you bring a dense, you know, compact enough mass here, which has therefore strong surface gravity, what it is going to do is curve this grid. Okay? So this warpage of the grid is evidence that there is mass or even energy. Okay, in general, not just mass and energy, but even momentum flux um, can produce um, um, this curvature. Okay, so that is how Einstein um, defined gravity: the curvature of space-time, and um, which means that uh, if you are in such a space-time, then um, the paths you follow will be defined by the curvature. If you want to spend, um, say, the least amount of time measured by your clock in going from one point in this curved space time to another point, then that least path, you know, time path, least proper time path, will be defined by the curvature of space time, right? Um, but also, you know, matter tells space time how to curve. So there is an intricate relationship between matter, energy, and the curvature of space-time. But not just that, the even more interesting aspect perhaps is that the cur this vacuum, even if it's just vacuum space-time with the curvature, it is an entity in its own right, meaning it can have dynamics, it can oscillate, and in the process, you know, create gravitational waves or scatter gravitational waves. So the stage which we by which we mean this curved space-time, even if it's vacuum, becomes an actor itself. Okay? Um, it can have effect on other, say, material body. <coughs> so, this is, uh, I don't know whether this animation will play, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, right. So, yeah, this is that three dimensional spatial grid I was talking about. Um, eventually, I will introduce a massive object from the left, and as it comes in, you will actually see that uh, what was previously completely in the flat slices. Uh, will get warped like this. I mean, you see that impression here, uh, but this is what you'll see in action. Oh, I did bring this up. All right. So you'll see, yeah, so it's all flat right now, but as this mass comes by, you see how that warpage happens, right? So to describe space, this curved space time, sometimes we just use one of these you know, so seemingly two-dimensional <coughs> surfaces. And Chandrasekhar's work, um, you know, even basically, when we started even before he, was, he entered his PhD program, um, argued that stars can meet a fate where at the end they leave behind something that is, uh, you know, unimaginably compact. So all of the mass collapses basically to the center of um, that object. Um, and in terms of these two-dimensional slices, we can depict them uh, with these depressions, all right? <coughs> Excuse me. In the sense that um, the gravity here is so strong that eventually there is a uh, surface which we call the event horizon, um, you know, more um, appropriately just horizon, let's say. Um, and the gravity is so strong that not even light can uh, escape from within uh, that horizon to the outside. Okay, so such objects are called black holes. Um, so this objects are predicted by uh, general relativity and this space-time structure is also described by general relativity. Um, and as you said, um, one of, I wouldn't really, okay, so there are multiple successes of general relativity. <clears throat> one thing general relativity is able to do is explain the position of Mercury's perihelion about the sun and for that I will use this prop so, you know, this is one of those two-dimensional slices, right? And to curve it, I can just uh, box into the center, but that will uh, spoil the whole piece of paper. So, I'm going to make an approximation, which is pretty good. So, I'll just introduce a def what is called a deficit angle. I mean, this is, this is covered enough for you, right? Okay. But what's happening is, Newton would have my planets go around in elliptical orbits. Okay. okay, seems like uh, I had good sleep last night, so this is good enough as an ellipse. But Einstein said if you bring in the sun, if you 
bring in the sun, then it creates it curvature, right? So it curves the space around it. And if you do that, if you then continue this orbit, you'll find that this aggregate is actually going to fall in. And then again, it's going to basically execute the extremal paths, or called geodesics, right, around this object in this curved geometry. But that is essentially a manifestation of the precision of Mercury's perihelion. Perihelion being the closest point of approach to Sun in Mercury's orbit. So, but the fact that there is this anomaly was already known before general relativity in the you know, 1800s. Um, so, if you know what the scientific method is, it is not sufficient for a hypothesis to explain a known phenomenon. What do you do next? You, your, 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 you know, paradigm uh, is not yet a theory, should actually make predictions, new predictions that should be tested, right? Um, what did Einstein predict? The curvature of uh, light. So, yeah, so the, <laughs> so you have heard of uh, Euclid's postulates, right? So let's say you draw two parallel lines in, uh, you know, again, uh, what may be previously flat space, right? So this could be star um, light, right? Um, so rays from far away stars. But the sun is out there, because I'm drawing it on the other side of the page, um, and you know that it's going to curve gravity. So if it curves gravity, you notice that actually that the essential effect is bending of starlight. And so in 1915, um, Einstein propounded his theory of gravity, general relativity, and by 1919, this bending of starlight was verified. Of course, you have to wait long enough, right, to go around the sun to see what happens because of the intervening presence of sun on parallel stars. Right? So this um, is what uh, is shown in this picture. Um, and then there are other things like gravitational redshift um, and so on. Um, you know that uh, the global positioning system uses the fact that the clocks don't travel at the same rate close to the Earth and far from the Earth, and you have to correct for this general relativity <coughs> to be able to find your location correctly. So, so general relativity is being used in day-to-day -day life now. Not gravitational waves, but who knows what is in store for the future. So, you already saw the Crab Nebula, um, and uh, and uh, have people here studied the pulsar mechanism? Yeah, Maybe. Yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, good. You timed my lecture fine. <laughs> so then I'm not going to spend any time on it. Um, but yeah, death of stars, I'll tell a little bit about this. So uh, to produce a neutron star or a black hole from the core of the, of the star, you need the initial star to be at least some eight to 10 times more massive than the sun, all right? Um, but these are massive stars and massive stars burn up fast and die young. Okay. Um, but burn up means that uh, in the center they're converting light nuclei into heavy nuclei. By doing what? By thermonuclear fusion. So they're fusing light nuclei. So the sun is still fusing hydrogen. I mean, its core is still predominantly rich with hydrogen. But gradually, that uh, inventory is being converted into um, heavier isotopes and helium. Right? But, for a, but then uh, the sun is not going to uh, um, uh, go much beyond that. And eventually um, it will land up as a uh, you know, planetary nebula with maybe a, a, a helium or carbon regenerate uh, um, uh, core, right, left of the center. Um, but if the initial star is massive enough, then um, this, um, you know, the nuclear, um, new, uh, yeah, stellar nuclear synthesis nuclei, I mean, they're not going to stop at something like carbon, but are going to fuse beyond to produce heavier nuclei, such as uh, oxygen, <coughs> silicon, iron, nickel. But, but when at the center the star is producing something like iron or nickel, um, the star is not going to produce any more heat or energy. Okay? That is because of what? Iron is the most stable in Yeah, so if you look at the nuclear <coughs> binding energy, Right, as a function of atomic number, you see that the peak is at iron. So beyond that, you're not going to release heat, which means that the only force available to the star is 
is gravity. There is no thermal support, right? So when that happens, uh, its core collapses. Okay, but this process can be an interesting one where, when the core is collapsing, the outer layers of the star have not yet realized that the ground beneath their feet um, is giving away. So by the time that core might have um, not fully collapsed, but actually rebound, uh, because eventually there is a uh, uh, degeneracy pressure because of electrons, um, which comes from the uncertainty principle. So it's quantum in nature, because you cannot pack uh, um, two you know, electrons in the same um, phase, part of safe space, or same state. So when this core is rebounding, by that time the outer layers are falling in, <coughs> and so there is a collision, right? And uh, as you know from momentum transfer, in a, um, the outer layers can then be driven out. And this picture may not be as rosy as it seems here, but what you'll have is more like the debris of the Crab Nebula. Um, but in the, in, in the center, the core can bounce, or not bounce, rather collapse further and leave behind a neutron star. Or um, if the initial mass of the star is really large, for example, tens of times the mass of Sun, then it can be a black hole. And um, neutron stars uh, are actually known to not just uh, be isolated in some cases, but also in binary systems. And this is the prototypical binary um, neutron star system called the Hulse and Taylor binary. Um, in this case, one of these stars is pulsing. Okay, <clears throat> at the moment, we don't, like, I'm pretty sure, we don't see the pulses from it anymore. But in 1974, and until about you know, 2008 or so, we could see um, the pulses. And by monitoring them, we act uh, Hulse and Taylor inferred that it in fact has a companion uh, whose mass and orbit they could predict. And But not just that, after observing it for a few years, Taylor and his collaborators noted that uh, the orbit of this binary pulsar is shrinking. Okay, And that, um, again, uh, uh, representation of that is the fact that the period um, is decreasing Okay, as a function of time. But that decrease is explained uh, very precisely by general relativity because the dots here are the observational points and this dashed line is predicted by general relativity. Okay. And, but why is it shrinking? Because the energy is being radiated away due to the energy. Yeah, so because energy is being radiated away due to the gravitational waves uh, that are being emitted by the system. So um, what is the orbital period of this binary? Somebody should check, that's a homework. But uh, I think it is of the order of eight hours or so. You will take now. Um, so how much longer will it take for this, these two neutron stars to come so close <coughs> that they're orbiting several cycles per second? Because it, you need that to happen uh, if you want to observe it in LIGO. Because LIGO will not see objects that are orbiting you know, in hours time scales, or even minutes. It will take. Um, of the order of 300 million years, okay, for the system to come that close, purely because of loss of, you know, gravitational binding energy through gravitational waves. Okay, um, so we are not going to see this in LIGO uh, in our lifetimes. Um, there is a proposed mission for observing gravitational waves from space called LISA, or Laser Interplanetary Space Antenna. Um, that has arms. Okay, so basically interferometry is being used where laser is bounced off, um, say, mirrors on Earth in LIGO-like -like detectors. In space, um, it's not quite the same thing, but that's a detail. But essentially what we're measuring is the change in the physical separation, okay, the distance separation between massive freely falling objects because of gravitational waves incident in this uh, uh, configuration, right? And, um, if the arm length is long enough, you can observe gravitational waves that have longer wavelength or smaller frequencies. Um, unfortunately, so, so LIGO detectors uh, eventually will be able to see objects um, that have orbital frequencies of the order of you know, five cycles per second to thousands of cycles per second. Okay, gravitational waves uh, from binary systems have frequencies that are twice that orbital frequency. So the wave frequency will be from 10 hertz to several you know, kilohertz. LISA can see these objects, or here is perhaps a better word, at lower frequencies, 
okay, um, down from about a tenth of a hertz, decihertz, to something like uh, some millihertz. This, if you do the calculations, you know, converting to the time period I told you, then this has a frequency that is uh, uh, at least a factor of uh, 10 or more, uh, you know, smaller than a millihertz. So this will not be visible in this app. Um, but uh, there are other uh, binary systems, for example, of white dwarfs, okay, which Lisa will see gravitational waves from. So, okay, I mean, this is this is an obvious impression of uh, the undulation of the two-dimensional surface I've been talking about, you know, to represent uh, curvature of space. Um, but then these are so when you create those these fluctuations on the two-dimensional surface. Um, you, which are traveling, right, then you get this representation of gravitational waves coming from uh, this, this black hole binary. What we observed was um, uh, this kind of a wave uh, in September 2015. Uh, this is not the data. Okay? Um, this is rather the pattern produced by uh, a numerical solution of general relativity to represent uh, gravitational waves from two black holes with masses of something like 29 and 36 times the mass of sun. So pretty heavy black holes, all right? So these waves are produced when the two black holes are still a few you know, radii apart, uh, but as they come and merge, you get the peak in the amplitude of the wave as a function of time, by the way. Time is increasing from left to right, and this is just a dimensionally strain amplitude, which reaches a peak value of about 10 to the minus 21. That's an extremely tiny value, right? I mean, this is, for example, if you're trying to measure the effect of this wave on two meters separated by a meter, then the change in the separation because of that amplitude will be one part in 10 to the 21. <clears throat> so that's very tiny, but this is how technology has advanced that we are able to pick up those tiny fluctuations. And so here the two black holes are merging to create a common horizon, and then the resulting black hole um, we had some strength in signal to, uh, uh, to, to, to see how massive it might have been, and it, that it turned out to be about 62 times the mass of the sun. And if you do the math, you realize that uh, you know, you're losing something Jeez, like three nice. times the mass of sun in just you know, gravitational wave energy. Okay? And this is a telltale uh, signature of a black hole that is settling down from a merger into a single axisymmetric spinning black hole. Uh, this pattern is known as a damp sinusoid. If the final object, for whatever reasons, was not a black hole, but um, um, you know, a really massive uh, material star, for example, so there are alternative theories, um, exotic theories that propose that you know, instead of black holes, we could have um, stars made of some sort of fields, like uh, you know, bosonic fields, boson stars, so to speak. Um, which um, maybe they wouldn't have this kind of a telltale signature, but rather um, m more slowly damped um, sinusoid. Okay, so not exponentially, but um, damped like um, the inverse power of time, you know, some power of time. Inverse. This is a numerical simulation of. Can I play it? Let's see. Yeah, I can. Of two black holes. Again, with the same masses, because these were produced after that discovery, but before we publicized it in February of 2016, these depressions are again the same, what I showed on, the, again, the two-dimensional slice representing uh, the spatial curvature. And you notice here, maybe, that there is a blue tracer that uh, um, is representing the gravitational wave, amplitude, and frequency. And eventually, when the two come and merge, you will get the peak amplitude there, and then uh, the ring down, as this last part of the signal is called, um, because of the waves coming from the merged object. Okay. So this is, of course, artificially slowed down. Um, any questions so far? So what do you mean by boson stars? What I mean by boson stars, um, so there are, um, Okay, you're undergraduate students, right? So you've not heard of, for example, the lambda five-fold theory in quantum physics. Okay, but 
Uh, you understand that there are two types of particles, right? There are bosons and fermions. Um, their um, you know, quantum spin properties are different, right? So the bosonic particles are integral spin particles. For example, photon has a spin of. Pardon? Photon means zero spin. Okay, that's an assignment. <laughs> I'll let you find out whether you're right or wrong. Um, gravitons, for example, are again predicted to be bosons. So we don't have a quantum theory of gravity, but these would have spins of two. Okay? <clears throat> um, and on the other hand, there are half integral uh, spin particles, for example, electrons, protons, neutrons. Um, so you can form neutron stars, for example, with neutrons and some mix of protons and electrons. Okay? Um, but you could also form, um, you know, interesting configurations. Let's call them. Yes, some people call them stars. Uh, from form from bosonic fields, okay. and these bosonic fields may not be a field of photons or gravitons, but something different, but bosonic in character with integral spin. And um, some people have proposed that uh, dark matter, which is still unexplained, right, uh, could be just a distribution of some you know, bosonic. Um, so bosonic stars Sir, are hypothetical. Uh, we have not discovered them. I don't want to go much beyond gravitational waves. So, putting the last question Sir, on this topic. So that dark matter is a boson, then it ma might have a spin. Then it should have a magnetic moment as well. But we don't see any electromagnetic interaction for dark matter. Um, yeah. So that is why it is not clear whether bosonic objects, like you know, in the form of stars or dark matter constituents, exist exist or not. Um, but on the other hand. Gravitational waves are a way to probe whether we see deviations from these uh, more standard uh, depictions of um, these objects. For example, um, this the last part that I showed. You know, this um, decay in the wave amplitude. Uh, this is characteristic of just a curved vacuum spacetime. So, as of uh, black holes, uh, if these were neutral stars. Then there is a different kind of decay that is predicted. And uh, let me finish. Okay. Um, on the other hand, if it is a boson star, then the decay would be of a different type. So there are ways gravitationally that we can perhaps distinguish one from the other. Okay. So, sir, uh, in the end, that the wiggles that we see is that due to the final merged black hole that is oscillating. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but eventually, this will settle down, as I said already, into a completely isosymmetric operation with a spin. In which case, there will be no gravitational wave emission, which is where the amplitude goes to. Yeah. So, how, how does uh, the fact that photon spin is one and electron spin is a half? Okay, so she answered that question. So, photon spin is not zero, it is one. Yeah. Uh, half uh, matter with respect to this. What's the last part? I didn't get the question. Uh, how does the spin of photons are, or electrons? Oh, okay. I don't understand. oh uh, no, uh, I was asking that, you know, uh, in the um, context of the question that what are boson stars, okay? Uh, so, right, so let me explain it this way. It's a good question. Um, perhaps you, some of you didn't get the question, so maybe I should start by explaining the question. The answer is, okay, right, the question is, how does ultimately the spin of the constituent particle affect um, let's say the gravitational wave emission, right? So the answer is this. Depending on what the constituent is of these objects, right? It it can be related to what is known as the equation of state of the body. By equation of state, one means how much pressure that object is able to exert for a given density. Okay. So and due to that. If you are able to measure, for example, the total energy or mass of the object, right, then for different equations of state, that object will have, for example, um, a different size. Even for neutron stars, we don't know what the equation of state is. Okay, so this is an important uh, uh, question. So people have predicted various models for, uh, because for example, although we call them neutron star, we don't know whether in the core of um, the constituents are actually quarks. Okay. Um, so depending on exactly what a neutron star is, how much pressure that star is able to exert, you know, within its own um, uh, body, um, um, depends on the equation of state for any given density. 
So there can be different amounts of pressure in the equation of state is different for the same density. All right? But that may that will mean that for the same mass, again, typically new thruster masses are of the order of 1.4 times the mass of sun. For the same mass, uh, the size of the new thruster will be different. Now the size affects exactly the nature of these gravitational waves, the amplitude and frequency. So by observing this wave pattern, we can tell what kind of equational state the emitting object has. Okay? So this discussion can be extended beyond different neutron star equations of state to the equation of state of a boson star or, or something more exotic. Okay? So this is how we can use these observations to name the nature of the object. Um, so, you know, we talked a little bit about the effect of gravitational waves, but essentially what's happening is the uh, separation between freely falling massive objects is going to change because of the incident waves. Um, this is just a nice way of representing one of the polarizations of the wave. Um, this is the effect of so-called plus polarization in some coordinate system. And these are all masses. So imagine them as the, you know, the bobs or beads of pendula. Okay, and now you will say, okay, so suppose you <coughs> form such a configuration of pendulum bobs, right? Um, you, you, may, uh, you may object that these are not freely falling because they are being held against gravity by their strings, right? So it is true that they are not vertically freely falling, but they are free to move in the horizontal direction. And this is what is being shown here. And um, an incident wave with a certain polarization can make them oscillate in this fashion, right? So, uh, remember that it is um, with electromagnetic, so plain polarized electromagnetic waves will not do this if they were, for example, charged particles. Right? Um, there is another polarization called the cross polarization where this oscillation will happen in, along axes that are 45 degrees rotated with respect to place. So this gives you an idea of how to detect these waves, right? What you, what you can do, for example, is if you, if you place mirrors on some of these masses, Right? and you're able to use them to bounce off light, then you can use the laser or some light to measure how these distances are changing. Right? So that is why laser interferometry is a good way to um, detect the presence of such waves. So here what's happening is that you know these two end masses can be imagined as those two, uh, two of those beads, right? And this is a laser source, this is a beam splitter, and you uh, shoot the laser onto this beam splitter, which splits the intensity of the incident beam into 50% along this arm and remaining 50% along the other arm. Uh, again, these don't have to be orthogonal. If it is orthogonal, it just makes our calculations somewhat easy. Um, and then they um, reflect back from these end masses and recombine here. But because these two laser <coughs> rays are originating from the same source, they are coherent, although they could be out of phase. So when they combine, then they will produce interference patterns, right? And um, if these are completely in phase, then um, it's a constructive interference, so you'll get a bright fringe there. Um, if they're you know, 180 degree out of phase, you'll get a dark fringe. So if these arm lengths are changing, then you can get an alternative set of uh, fringe patterns, right? So this is what is shown in this animation. Again, I'm not sure whether I'm sure. So that's the laser, these are the end mirrors, that's the beam splitter. This is where you may have a detector like a photodiode that measures the intensity incident after uh, the recombination of the beams. So at the moment, the arm lengths are the same, and if you work out how the phases are changing from the different reflections, uh, they will be out of phase here so that they will cancel. This is complete destructive interference, and you get no intensity back there. But as a wave impingence, you know, it will maybe elongate this arm while it crunches that arm, and then the, phase, the two light rays may be in phase, and you get a bright fringe. But this will keep alternating, or even the frequency of oscillations will change, like you saw in the black hole merger, right? But you can therefore extract the pattern and be able to tell what the source is that is emitting these waves. So there are two such detectors, well, there are multiple detectors, but LIGO has two such detectors. Um, and uh, LIGO, by the way, is an acronym for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Observatory. 
Um, one of the detectors is in Hanford, uh, four kilometer arm lengths, and its sister detector, almost a twin, is in Livingston, Louisiana. Um, you know, these two detectors are about 3,000 kilometers apart. Um, we kept them far enough so that what? baseline is triangular. That's right. So uh, that is, I mean, that is the scientific reason um, that we can because these detectors, each detector has um, it's not quite an isotropic sensitivity, but we don't have very good directionality, right? So it is difficult to tell from a single detector where the source is. You know, this is what happens if you are successfully closing one of your ears. It's difficult to tell where the sound source is. Um, but with two ears, you can measure certain differences in the arrival time of your signal. And so the further apart your ears are, maybe the better you can localize the far away sound source, okay? <clears throat> in the concert, that's the problem. Oftentimes it is not clear. Of course, electronically, I mean, this, there will be speakers, but suppose that there were no speakers, like in Beethoven's time, right? Then it's not very easy from a far away distance to tell you that. Um, to correlate your what you're seeing with eyes, with um, what you're hearing with your ears in terms of um, the source of the sound. Um, but it is also true that if you are building detectors um, far apart, it helps in reducing cross-correlated noise. Remember, we are measuring very tiny fluctuations um, you know, from astrophysical sources. And uh, there are different ways in which terrestrial sources, noise sources can somewhat mimic these part of astrophysical sources in the signals that we use. So, which is why it is good to, for example, have them on different continental things. You know, because uh, 10 hertz, 20 hertz, these are very close to you know, seismic vibration frequencies. Okay? And uh, that is where we require a lot of sensitivity because our signal, especially from binary sources, um, spends a lot of time in those low frequencies. So we can accumulate a lot of uh, energy and therefore be able to tell that, okay, this is really astrophysical. Um, there's a, by the way, so we are building a detector like this on Indian soil in this state, okay, almost, uh, 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 well, somewhat at the center of the state. Uh, it's called LIGO India. Um, and uh, we will, there is, we are already in need for people who can actually help construct such detectors. Um, by the time uh, you are ready to use this detector, I think in the 2025, so which is when it should come into operation. So you can start doing science with it. But who knows, at that time, perhaps we will embark on a different quest of building more sensitive detectors. Um, LISA, by the way, uh, has been um, earmarked by the European Space Agency to be launched in something like uh, 2034. Okay, so very nice opportunity is coming if you are interested in using gravitational waves um, to, 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 to do science. Okay. Um, oh, those by the way, so that's the cage of uh, one of those end mirrors. Okay, the end mirror would actually go somewhere there. Uh, now this, I say it's a cage because the mirror is not fixed to this uh, contraption. You don't want it to be. Okay, rather there are in fact piano wires which you cannot see very well um, that hold these mirrors. Um, okay, um, so the mirrors are suspended. Um, the, the, the surrounding cage is uh, for other reasons because, for example, we um, need ways of controlling the motion of the mirrors, all right? Um, we even want to characterize them. So, so this cage allows us to you know, fix uh, other devices by which we can actuate the mirrors, we can move the mirrors, for example, through electromagnetic or coil drivers. Uh, because we want to tell, for example, how much force is required to make the mirror move by a certain amount of distance. That's called calibration. We want to calibrate this detector so that ultimately, based on the motion we see, we can tell, okay, how much energy actually is being dumped by uh, not necessarily just coil drivers, but also by remote object. Um, and then these mirrors, yes? Sir, since the fluctuations are of the order of 8 to the power minus 21 centimeter, so even the vibrations of the molecules on the surface of the mirror, they should also come into the picture. So how do we control that? So do we cool the mirror or something? No, we don't. But uh, that's another technology that um, Kagra, a Japanese detector, uh, is uh, planning to use. So it is under construction. So, but who will answer that question? Japanese has so many earthquakes. Okay, that's a different question. Let us answer one question at a time. No, that's, yeah, so which tells you that, you know, we do have ways of 
damping down uh, vibration. But of course, if there is a strong enough earthquake, the fact is that uh, our detector will be taken out of lock in the sense that okay, we will not be able to get the sensory uh, moment to the end, we'll have to then get it back into lock. So, but but there are ways we do that. I mean, this is true. These detectors are so sensitive that the Japanese earthquake will affects uh, even the detector in Hanford. Uh, uh, yes. So, but coming back to the other question, the so the question is the you know if you actually do the calculation, you will find that uh, um, this is uh, ten to the minus twenty one is way too tiny. Uh, even quantum fluctuations of the uh, molecules on the surface of the mirror um, will give an average amplitude that is uh, uh, that comes to you know in strain comes to about uh, more than that. So, what is happening? How are we taking account of that? How are we not being affected by that limit. If you think about it, huh? how do you subtract quantum uncertainty? <laughs> no, I encourage you to think it. Um, so the thing is that the beam is wide enough, that the spot size is wide enough, um, yeah, of the order of, say, centimeter or so. Uh, but that is large enough to have an Avogadro's number worth of molecules. So, although each molecule is vibrating more than effectively that strain, but it gets yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, and these uh, mirrors are then housed in these uh, the vacuum chambers because we don't want interference even by um, air molecules. Uh, in fact, uh, not just these vacuum chambers, but also these tubes along which the you know laser travels four kilometers. Um, they are heated initially; they're baked so as to degas because. Air molecules stick to everything, okay? Even the uh, walls of these chambers and tubes. So you have to degas it enough so that ultimately you can bring down the pressure inside these chambers and uh, the vacuum tube to something like 10 to the minus 9 or 12. So, um, again, so a lot of things are involved here. Yeah, so that's the tube while it is still in that corner station where the beam speed is, eventually it will exit uh, and run for about 4 kilometers. 10 to the minus 21, perhaps you already know how small it is, so I don't have to tell this crowd what it is, but basically, you know, the ratio of a tennis racket to earth is uh, approximately the same as the ratio between the vibrations we saw uh, in 2015, but we have seen a few others later, um, and uh, the size of an atom. And uh, and yes, yeah, we have to beat all these kinds of noises, um, you know, dams opening somewhere, earthquakes, or um, logging trees, this happens in the living strength site, for example, or traffic which is everywhere. Right? You just have to go like 500 meters and you come across. So, and there are ways of uh, tackling all of those things. In some cases, you know, subtracting them as one of you suggested, but not for quantum ways, but this, um, classical. Um, and sometimes we even have active um, you know, planting systems so that we, um, uh, or feed forward, where we actually take into account uh, what kind of noise is impacting our detector, because there are other monitors like seismometers which measure ground motion, and then use that signal to construct a sort of a negative signal to compensate for that and not affect our mirrors. Um, so neutral stars, you um, heard me talk about, somewhat, and indeed they can. We don't. So this is one of the current puzzles we want to solve. We don't know. Uh, what the equation of state of a neutron star is, but with gravitational waves, um, like from uh, the event in August, we are already constraining the nature of uh, matter in, in these objects. Um, so yeah, that is the 170817 event. So 2017 August, um, 17th August. So we saw such a merger. <coughs> of course, this is all artists simply. But we are able to simulate these things. Okay, this is not a neutron star, neutron star, but a, a, or even a black hole, black hole. This is something we have not seen yet, but we hope to see when these objects, this is a neutron star black hole, merger, numerical relativity is able to uh, 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 simulate this, but you notice how as the neutron star uh, comes close to the black hole, it gets tidally disrupted, and then the disrupted material is what? It's rich in neutrons, okay? Not just neutrons, actually, I should have said rich in heavy nuclei. These are neutron-rich nuclei, so they are unstable, okay? And because of the instability, they are going to break apart. Which, But breaking apart means what? Fission. So there is going to be fission, some will again radioactively decay. 
whatever they do, essentially they're going to emit energy. Some of this energy will be in um, you know, infrared or optical wavelengths. So, the, so people had predicted that uh, not just neutral star black hole, but neutral star neutral star mergers can also produce electromagnetic energy. <coughs> in fact, one of the um, most uh, energetic emissions in the universe um, is from objects known as short duration gamma ray bursts. Okay. But uh, for a long time, we didn't know what produces them, except yeah, it was conjectured that maybe neutral star, neutral star collisions produce these gamma ray bursts. Okay. Um, but there was uh, uh, the other prediction of uh, other kinds of emission coming from this um, ejector. Thankfully, uh, in 1708-17, we actually let me fast forward. We actually saw these emissions. So, <coughs> so uh, LIGO and Virgo together localized based on the gravitational waves we received. You know, Virgo is another detector in Europe, so you can use three baseline uh, localization by measuring the time delay. Yeah, I, I hope you understand time delay, right? So, for example, if the object is there, then the signal from that object is going to reach this year first, or you know, this detector first, then that one. And then um, there could be another detector out there, and that will also have some time delay with respect to these two detectors. So you can use these time delays and triangulate and say where in the sky the source is. Plus the fact is that each detector has some directionality. It's not totally astronomical. So we combine them, and so LIGO and Virgo together could localize um, this, um, you know, 17th August event to a patch in the sky which was about 31 square degrees wide. How much is a square degree? How wide is the moon? Half a degree. Half a degree, so a quarter square degree. Okay, so this is 31, which is wide because the moon is pretty wide, which is difficult for electromagnetic observatories to handle. Why? Because the 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 patch size at which a telescope typically points is much less than a square degree. So and and these emissions don't last very long. Okay, we were learning. We, we eventually realized how long they last, but um, so. We, there was a race for capturing the electromagnetic emissions in the first night itself. But it's difficult to scan the full 31 square degrees in a single night. All right? We were lucky in this case because this object turned out to be also not very far. It was at about 40, 41 megaparsecs away, right? where a parsec is about 3.26 light years. So if you do the math, it is about 130 million light years away. Not very far, in fact, just somewhat beyond the nearest cluster of galaxies, which is known as the Virgo cluster. That itself is about 60 million light years from us. Uh, but then Fermi uh, detectors, which is actually a gamma ray burst detector, it was able to see gamma ray emissions and also localize, it did its own localization, which is consistent with the LIGO green localization. The, the gamma ray burst monitor localized it um, in this um, blue circle. So they are consistent. Remember, they all have some error marks because again, I cannot measure time this infinitely accurately. There is some uh, error mark <coughs> that translates into a sky position error mark for LIGO detectors um, or also other triangulation detectors. Um, then there are other detectors which had their own uh, localization patches, but nicely they are all consistent. Eventually, SWAP, an optical telescope, found something um, um, at, uh, at the same night um, at that point. And it turned out to be uh, uh, the, a galaxy, okay, <clears throat> some NGC, I think 4993. And uh, after a certain number of days, uh, you see that spot has actually disappeared. So this is the best scenario that, in fact, there was a binding neutron star merger that happened in the vicinity of this galaxy. Um, and the electromagnetic emission from it lasted for some time, but eventually faded away. But not just that, we have also seen radio waves. So that is another radio connection. Okay. Why radio waves? Because the material, as it plows the, from, from this, you know, uh, the, the neu neutron or nuclear rich material, as it plows through the interstellar medium, okay, which has electrons, for example. Right? So the, there are energy transfers and excitations that can then cause radio waves to be emitted. Um, so the radio waves, in turn, can tell us about the property of the medium around these mergers. Okay, we don't know exactly how the medium might be in the vicinity of this galaxy, how electron rich it is. Uh, but those are the kind of things we can learn from these simultaneous observations. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to fast forward. I'm almost there. Uh, so yeah, LIGO India is being built here. Kagra is the Japanese detector I referred to. 
Uh, there are lots of bar detectors shown here, which are essentially out of operation now because they have more sensitive interferometric detectors. So in future, you can expect yeah the two LIGO detectors to continue, maybe with in, indeed with better sensitivities. Um, and then Virgo detector is near PISA, uh, Kagra and uh, LIGO India are coming up, and then you know eventually LISA up in space. Um, the, uh, yeah, I'm out of time, so I'm going to end. I just wanted to tell you that, by the way, um, I mentioned how these nuclear, you know, neutron rich nuclei can have undergo fissile decay and radiative decay. Those are places where um, it is uh, proposed that uh, heavy elements like uh, gold and platinum are also produced. Um, there is a bit of it in your blood as well, so you may owe existence of life to uh, such uh, neutron star neutron star collisions. Um, we are for, and this is why it is important to combine this multi messenger effect. Right? We learn much more by combining observations with uh, electromagnetic telescopes, particle detectors, and gravitational waves than what you can with, this, with any single information channel. And if you already know that uh, the black holes we could infer because of accretion disk emission in our galaxy in the past. Okay, they were, these are all extra binary black holes. They used to, you know, they have masses like this. But we now know that there, there can be more massive black holes, which we are observing in gravitational waves. We have also observed black holes in gravitational waves that are similar in mass as this. So, so this population has suddenly, uh, suddenly expanded in masses. <laughs> in neutron stars also, we will one day have a better idea about the demographics. This in turn is important because they teach us much more about the you know, um, how the mass in the galaxy is distributed um, across uh, different massive objects, right? Um, so, in summary, um, you know, 150914 uh, opened the floodgates for a variety of astrophysical explorations. Uh, so, the Nobel Committee obviously, uh, I would say, actually awarded the prize to these pioneers who, in their own Nobel speeches, you know, acknowledged that uh, this was possible because of a worldwide effort, simply because these are very complex instruments, the science also requires expertise from various areas. Um, and again, combining these areas, we learn much more about these objects. The discoveries didn't stop with it, you know, we have gone to observe binary neutron stars, and um, multi-messenger astronomy existed before with other branches of astronomy, but now they have, for the first time, included gravitation as well. And, you know, I hope to learn more about nuclear interactions at high densities because it's amazing that those microphysical uh, aspects can influence macroscopic objects, which you know, gravitational waves can tap into. And of course, I'm waiting for the day when we'll see something which we didn't uh, imagine before. Thank you for your time. But uh, if you have any questions, I can spend a few more minutes. When does your next class start? Huh? Okay. So there's some time. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't know whether this question's crazy, but. Uh, our uh, Earth has a natural frequency, and when we are um, uh, observing gravitational waves, they have a certain frequency. So, will there be any chance that they could be in resonance at some point of time? You wish. <laughs> um, that's a good question. The problem is uh, the energy that is lost by gravitational waves uh, into any system, let alone the Earth, um, is very, very tiny. So it's like saying that, yeah. Um, so indeed, I mean, Earth has a natural frequency which is uh, in the you know, ballpark of a hertz to a few hertz. Okay, um, and there are, um, yeah, gravitational signals um, that are at that frequency. Um, whether these sources are persistently at that frequency, we don't know. In the binary neutron stars, have an instantaneous frequency that will cross that Earth's resonance frequency and then climb up. Um, so momentary, you know, just interaction won't allow um, transfer of energy that much anyway. But even if there was something that was persistent, um, uh, for resonance to happen, you need that amplitude to be strong enough, right? It's like saying that, okay, you know that uh, the military asks the soldiers to break their step, so not march as they cross bridges because otherwise uh, it's exactly. right, yeah resonance, right? But on the other hand, if the march but at a very, very tiny uh, you know, amplitude, then the bridge is not moving. Okay, you, so, uh, in electromagnetic spectrum, uh, we see objects uh, even high red shifted at 6 or 7. Even then we get some energy uh, here, quite a high energy compared to the ambition. 
So where there is a three solar mass energy dissipation, why is the so less energy? I just so I'm, I'm sorry. I said some thanks for Korea. So the energy is uh, you're right. So let me correct a bit of my last answer. The energy brought in the gravitational, uh, or maybe I don't need to. I mean, the energy brought in is large, but I was talking about energy transfer, which happens because of some form of coupling, right? So here, that coupling is facilitated. You know, ultimately, that part is yeah, facilitated by the Newton's constant g, which is very very tiny. So, so the ultimately the energy transfer that's happening is very tiny. So the energy emitted is large, no doubt. I mean, these are most luminous in terms of the energy. Yeah. Yes. Um, sir, in this interferometer, we are taking into account the uh, compression in the space. Uh, to detect um, the interference, but then if we keep a clock in the in a gravitational wave field, so that clock should also have uh, certain effects on it. So its time should be um, delayed or increased. So can we use this effect to uh, detect gravitational waves in another way? Yeah. So you know, I said the Lisa thing. I can return to later. Lisa essentially uses something like that. So it does not use mirrors to cause things. It it it. it, uh, it uh, it, it basically locks in the phase. So, you know, again, you can track if tracking phase is similar to tracking yes. you know, the rate of clock. So, and then emits another laser with that phase. So, but but you're right. Yeah. So one can do it that way. So, you know, essentially a form of uh, in this case laser ranging, but we use it also for radial ranging. Uh, but yeah, that can be used as well. But this is ultimately see some of the clocks use laser beams to keep track of time. Yeah. Sir, uh, what are the specific criteria that help us to identify our gravitational wave? What, are, what makes it special? Um, I'm trying to still parse your question. What makes I mean, the from detection? All this wave like, so that is uh, the, I mean, triple or the phase change we are receiving that is from the due to and gravitational wave. How can we detect that? I mean, what are the criteria to identify what we are seeing is a gravitational wave? Like, okay, let me see. Maybe I'm understanding your question. Are you trying to suggest that, okay, well, I mean, there is some oscillation. We, so these detectors are measuring strain as a function of time. I see some oscillation. How do I know that it is not just um, some, you know, the laser intensity fluctuating? Okay, but actually it's an astrophysical source. Is that the question? That's the question? Yeah, I mean, okay, that, if so, then it's a good question. So now you better roll up to that question. <laughs> so the, the answer is, one way we do that is the, you know, to use multiple detectors. We want to see the same pattern in multiple detectors. Okay. Indeed, gravitational waves could have been produced by the early universe, okay, because of density fluctuations in the primordial soup. So, okay. um, this, this wave will just be noise. How do I distinguish that noise in the sense that you know the amplitude is fluctuating um, across the frequency band and uh, with in a random way? Okay, so how do I know this is not my detector fluctuation? You know, because of some terrestrial reason, right? So we do that by testing whether that same fluctuation, okay, perhaps a shifted in phase because of the intervening space, is observed in another detector. So we do correlations. We correlate that signal uh, across multiple detectors to see whether the correlation is uh, stronger than just noise correlations. Over time, the noise kind of correlations will um, will change with time at a pace that is slower than uh, real signal correlation. Okay, that's one way. Second is each detector has hundreds of thousands of monitors to check how various um, uh, components are uh, behaving with time. Like I mentioned, their laser intensity, okay, or some ambient temperature in some other part, or the wind blowing. Or uh, you know, seismometers measuring the uh, uh, the earth vibration, or magnetometers measuring magnetic field fluctuations. So we check whether any of these patterns are correlated with something that um, has some indication of being a signal. Okay. The third is whenever theory is able to predict what the signal pattern is like, you know, the amplitude and frequency increasing exactly as predicted by Einstein's theory whether we see that pattern in our detector. So there are multiple such checks okay, that are um, uh, conducted before we actually, which is why it takes a bit of time between 
the Garda Shri of Singh arriving and the collaboration making a statement through a publication that we actually established that this is the Astro Other questions? So, what is the detected speed of the gravitational waves? Yeah, so um, theory says it is the speed of light, but because now we are seeing both electromagnetic waves and gravitational waves from the same source, we can actually compare them. And um, I forget the exact number, but you know, the last observation of this binary neutral star, it, I mean, the two speeds um, are, I mean, there is only a very small difference, but this difference could be because of, for example, the fact that they were emitted at slightly different times. For example, the ga gamma ray burst signal um, was seen 1.7 <coughs> seconds after the gravitational wave peak, but we don't completely understand the mechanism of the gamma ray um, uh, uh, production. So that time difference could be just because they started running you know, at different times. Last question, yeah. Sir, uh, like electromagnetic waves are interactions with particles and they tend to change, right? Like, we get different readings for the interaction with different particles. So does gravitational waves also interact with particles and they tend to change? Change particles. No, not change particles. Means they change like the, the, the wave shift. itself changes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So again, it's related to the first question. <coughs> the interaction is so weak, all right, that the wave essentially goes through the whole Earth, for example, through these detectors, unchanged because the amount of energy transfer is high, is extremely minuscule. So the, the type of changes that can happen is like light lensing. Similarly, you know, gravitational waves impact. There will be lensing at the same time. Okay. But in terms of loss in energy, it is negligible. Okay. Very good. So good luck with the rest of your classes.